good morning. Good morning. We welcome you all to our service today. This is the second Sunday in Lent. As I mentioned last week, the Lenten season is a period of 40 days, but that does not include the Sundays. The Sundays are always thought of as a mini resurrection or a mini Easter time where our thoughts are drawn a little bit more to the joy of what the Savior has brought us in his resurrection. One other thing I forgot to mention last week. These Sundays before uh, Good Friday and the Sundays after Easter, uh, six before, six, seven after, were so important to the early Christians that they gave names to these Sundays. If you remember, some of you, the old hymnal, as we used to call it, it had those names designated for each of the Sundays. Last Sunday was known as Invocabit Sunday. And you all remember your Latin from your high school days, if you had Latin in high school? Did anybody have Latin in high school? No one? Oh, a couple did. Oh, Ohio, of course, they would have Latin there. <laughs> um, Invocabit means he will call. And the idea is that he will call upon the Lord. It always comes from the psalm verse that was uh, for the day. He will call upon the Lord and the Lord will hear and answer. Well, you have to think of Jesus in his temptation calling upon the Lord for the strength that he needed to meet the temptations also throughout the Lenten season. Today, if you look at the top of your bulletin, you'll see that today is known as Riminiscara Sunday. You might catch the sense there because in the English we have a word reminisce. And when you reminisce, you go back and you think about things. It, it means to remember. And once again, you have that as one of the opening phrases in the psalm that was used for the day. Lord, remember me in your mercy and grace. And you'll notice that as we sing the psalm today. You'll notice that perhaps also in the lessons that are there, that the Lord cannot forget his people. That's why he sent the Savior. He remembers us in his mercy and grace. So those are the thoughts reflected in our service today. This morning we follow the order of morning praise or the matin service that you'll find on page 45 in the Christian Worship Hymnal. And that service begins with the singing of our opening hymn, hymn number 108, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary.
Again, we follow the order of morning praise, the mass and service on page 45 in the front part of Christian worship hymnal. And we now begin towards the bottom of the page with the responsive versicles. Psalm 25 on page 74 in the front part of the hymnal. We ask the congregation to sing the refrain portions. There are three of them. The second half of each of the verses. And then the glory be to the Father towards the end. <laughs>
I'll turn our attention to the scripture lessons for the day. Again, the thought of the Lord remembering us in his mercy and love would be a good theme reflected in each of our lessons. Do you care to follow along? For those who are here today, you'll find it printed on the back of your bulletin. And for you who are watching on home, you can find them online on our website. Our first lesson today is from Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 to 17. Can God forget his people? Can God forget them when they do things that are totally opposite what his nature is all about and what they are as his people and are to be? Well, we see in our lesson here that God does not forget his people and even when they do things that are so far against him, he still comes to them to call them back, to remind them of his care in their lives. We read in Genesis chapter 28. Jacob set out from Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. He came to a certain place and decided to spend the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from that place, put it under his head, and lay down to sleep in that place. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. There were angels of God ascending and descending on it. There at the top stood the Lord, who said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you are lying I give to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. In you and in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back again into this land. Indeed, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Jacob woke up from his sleep and he said, Certainly the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and he said, How awe-inspiring is this place? This is nothing other than the house of God, and this is the gate to heaven. Here ends the word of our Lord from the Old Testament. Our epistle lesson today is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 1. Can God forget you? Paul gives the definite answer here, no, not in Christ. As we stand in faith in him, we stand in the grace of our Lord, not outside of his grace. He remembers his people through the Savior. We read in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice confidently on the basis of our hope for the glory of God. Not only this, but we also rejoice confidently in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces patient endurance, and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope, and hope will not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For at the appointed time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. It is rare indeed that someone will die for a righteous person. Perhaps someone might actually go so far as to die for a person who has been good to him. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, it is even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, it is even more certain that since we have been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And not only is this so, but we also go on rejoicing confidently in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received this reconciliation. Here ends the word of our Lord from the epistle. And now a song that reflects some of these ideas of the Lord remembering and coming to his people day by day.
Please rise for the reading of our gospel lesson today. The gospel lesson this morning is recorded in the book of Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 31. This is one of the very specific times that Jesus first tells his disciples about everything that lies ahead for him in his death and his resurrection. He also encourages those disciples to know that he will always remember them in life and that they are to follow him in life in a very specific way. Disciples have trouble understanding what we read in Mark chapter 8. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the experts in the law, be killed, and after three days rise again. He was speaking plainly to them. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But after turning around and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have your mind set on the things of God, but the things of men. He called the crowd and his disciples together and said to them, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. After all, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? In fact, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned to our way, own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 355 in Christian worship. 355. Take the world, but give me Jesus.
Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we look at the Old Testament lesson from Genesis chapter 28. I'll read just the closing verses once more. At verse 16. Jacob woke up from his sleep and he said, Certainly the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awe-inspiring is this place. This is nothing other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed in our Lord. If everything you ever said or did or thought were written in a book and portrayed in a movie, how would you feel about that? I mean everything. Every dumb decision, every bungled blunder, every tiny tidbit. Were it all recorded for everyone to see? Every little bit, I think I would shudder. <laughs> and I would bang that the book would never be printed, the movie never produced. Oh, I probably like the nice complimentary things that might have been said about me. But who would want others to see and to hear the sad, the bad, and the sordid of the things that I have said or thought or done? Especially when I was young and often foolish. At times, the past haunts us. It haunts me. The attitudes, the actions, surely they would have been a disaster if God had not somehow stepped in to preserve me from the consequences. Lord, I beg you, like King David did, do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your mercy, Lord, remember me because of your goodness. Without you, Lord, can anyone stand unashamed before the world? Surely Jacob couldn't. For three days he had been walking briskly here. I would imagine running at times also, fleeing because of that which he had just done in the recent past. And he still had a long way to go in his journey ahead of him. Alone without companion or a servant to talk to, no camel, not even a donkey, Jacob was on his own. To an extent, he was used to this because he was a shepherd. He took care of sheep. But he had never felt alone as much as he did at this point. This was an undying loneliness brought about by the foolish words and deeds that he had done. Because of them, he could not go back home because his brother Esau was waiting to kill him. You know, at times people, yeah, even Christians may have enemies who simply hate their guts and they want to do them in. I don't think that I have any Esau's in my life, but I have done things I know in the past that have upset people. I suppose maybe even greatly upset them. In a careless moment, perhaps it could be said an ungodly one, I did something, I said something that I regretted. And oh, how I wish that I could undo that and take it back. But it's too late. You can't undo the past. The result for Jacob, he felt sad, he felt sick at heart. He felt all alone in this world. Behind him lay all the pleasant scenes of his home, his childhood home, the happy memories perhaps of the carefree youth. Behind him lay his mother, Rebecca, whom he deeply loved. And behind him, the bitterest thought of all, was his father whom he had treated so poorly. Isaac was old and feeble, and blind. It appeared that he might not live much longer. And it was not very likely that Jacob was ever going to go back and see his father again 
to fall at his feet and to cry, Father, forgive me for what I've done to you. It saddened Jacob's heart. Ahead of him, he didn't know what lay. He hardly knew where he was going. He had never been there before in his life. He had never met the people, although they were some of the closest relatives of his family. It was a foreign country to which he was running, and he had no gifts to present those to whom he was going, which was, in one sense, a blunder in the countries that are far to the east of us. He had no sheep, he had no cattle with which to start a new life again. And the way to the place that he was headed was long and weary and dangerous, especially for a young man, a foolish young man, traveling all alone on foot. All alone with a sad heart. The sun set as he climbed another of the steep hills that cover that area of Palestine, endless hills, one right after the other. No town there, no inn where he could stay the night, not even a shepherd's tent. He ate a little bit of the bread, perhaps, that he carried in the bag that was with him, and then he lay down to sleep, resting his head on a stone. At last he fell asleep, lying there alone on the mountain, worn out as much by his sad heart as by the extreme hardship of the journey. As Jacob slept, he began to dream. Behold, a ladder. It appeared extending from heaven down to earth, below, right by his head. Wow, look, angels going up and down on that ladder. What were the angels doing there in that lonely spot? And behold, the Lord himself was at the top, right above him. The Lord who had so often appeared to his grandfather Abraham and had appeared to his father Isaac, but who Jacob perhaps never dared to hope would ever appear to him. So Jacob was not alone, after all. No way. The naked eye could not see it. But the angels stood all around, and the Lord himself was watching over from above. Lord, what a marvelous way to show a sad and a lonely man the goodness that is within you that cheers a sad heart with the assurance that your presence will ever be with them. You have not forgotten Jacob. You remembered him in his time of need. But this sight wasn't intended just for Jacob. This sight was intended for me and for you. It's a reminder. Because there come those moments in life when life and everything in it seems to pass even the Christian by. Sometimes because of the foolish things that we do, oftentimes because of the hatred of the world that is around us, because Christians deny themselves and take up the cross to follow their Lord. In either case, Satan wants me to feel alone and to feel abandoned so that he can claim, Lord, you've left me. But those lonely hours need not be filled with gloom and sadness because you, Lord, hallow the hour with its comfort of your presence. I will never leave you and forsake you. I will be with you always to the end of the world. No harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For I will command my angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, lest at any time you should dash your foot against a stone. How more graphically, Lord, could you bring about the truth of those promises and to make them real to us than when you let us see through Jacob's eyes the angels ascending and descending over him? 
and you above it all. Truly, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Such a wonderful account to remember when my heart is sad and I feel alone. In Christ you assure me that my sins are forgiven and that you have justified me by faith. So we have peace with God, like Paul says, to our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access into this grace in which we now stand. By faith I know where I stand with you. Or better to say, by faith I know where you stand with me. Never alone, angels watching over me, my Lord, and so are you. So help me be strong and courageous, not afraid or terrified. For you, the Lord God, goes with me wherever I go. Jacob awoke, and everything around him probably seemed to have taken on a different type of character and view. This was not a lonely, isolated mountaintop. He gasped. Certainly, the Lord was in this place, and I was not aware of it. How awe-inspiring is this place. This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. He lifted up a stone that he had placed under his head for that pillow that night, and he poured oil on it as an offering and as a promise to the Lord. He called the place Bethel, that means house of God. Feeling safe and secure, as though at home, and warm in God's forgiving love, this was his loving response to the goodness that God had shown him, just like he promises and shows to those who go after and go before us in faith. I've never dreamed a dream like this. But I have now seen it through the eyes of Jacob. And from it, Lord, I learned through Jacob that night what your promises and your care are all about. You remember us not for what we have done, but you remember us out of your goodness as we come to you in Christ Jesus who took away our sin. In him, your mercy and your fatherly care in forgiving all my sins is real. That gives strength to the sinner to move forward in life, knowing that the memories of the past, the foolishness, our present faults, or our future failures are eliminated from your sight as far as the east is from the west. You promise I will forgive your guilt and I will remember your trespasses no more. Your remembrance of us is not based on our past, nor is it based on the present or even on our future. It is based upon your Son who gave his life for us and who said in the New Testament that he is the ladder that leads to heaven. Remember me because of your goodness in me. In faith, wherever I go, I will feel secure because you are with me to protect me and to bless me with your love. And may I respond to that love of yours by offering my complete self to you like Jacob did, not with empty promises, but with heartfelt vows of service to you until that day when you bring me into the warmth and the safety of the eternal home that is above, to dwell with you in your abiding presence forever. Lord, grant that to us all, for your name's sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as we join together in singing the hymn of old, We Praise You, O God, the Te Deum Laudamus, You'll find that on page 48 in the front part of the service in the Matin service. Page 48, we praise you, O Lord.
now continue in the order of matins on page 50 with the prayers and the blessing. We begin with the singing of the Kyrie. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, we have much to be thankful for, your protection, your preservation, and above all, our salvation by your hand. Christ has opened the way to your presence for us. He is the ladder to heaven. We praise you for your promises and mercy through him. May your holy angels watch over us and keep us safely in you. Be with us as we go out and come in, ascend and descend in service to you and others. Hear us for your name's sake. We also pray this day that you would be with the family of Carl Smith, whose funeral we celebrated yesterday as he came before you in his faith in Christ. We ask that you would be with that family and grant them peace and rest, knowing that you as the Savior will walk with them also all the way of their lives. And O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all that we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Around the throne of God a van. Hymn 198. <laughs>
Again, we welcome you to our service and pray that you've been strengthened in your faith by God's Word. We'll be here again next Sunday at this time online, so you can join us at 9 o'clock. Also, this coming Thursday, we'll do have the third in our series of midweek Lenten services. Again, that's on Thursday. Uh, we have a supper at quarter to 6 and then uh, the service at 6.30. We invite you to join us then as we look at the wondrous love of our Savior this week as he stands before the Santa Dread. And then for next Sunday, I'll give you the name of the Sunday. And this is your assignment, to go home and find out what it means. <laughs> the name of the Sunday is Okuli. Okuli. Now there is something that some people have that ties in with that. And I'm giving you a hint. So, Okuli Sunday, again on the third Sunday of the month, we'll see how the Lord watches over us. Uh, Lord, go with you in the week that lies ahead, and uh, uh, may he bless all your endeavors in his name. Mm -hmm.